Hey, it's Laura. Welcome to TMST. In a recent episode with Jody White, we dove deep into the contours of love addiction and codependency. And the response to that conversation was big and loud and clear. You asked us to keep going and go deeper. So that's what we're doing today. I am so excited for you to meet today's guest, Kelly McDaniel. Kelly is a clinical psychologist who first coined the phrase mother hunger back in her 2008 book, Ready to Heal. She had been noticing this pattern in her practice of this deep wounding in women that was often masked by process addictions like drugs or alcohol or patterns of behavior like love addiction. She saw that women were trying to address this deep sorrow that she eventually named Mother Hunger, and that is also the title of her latest book. Kelly has helped so many women, including me, demystify the search for love, for lack of a better phrase. She's literally giving us a compass that we can use to steer ourselves out of that struggle with that aching, lonely, often very desperate feeling emptiness. She is warm and kind and speaks profound truths in a very gentle, reassuring way. Kelly says that healing love addiction is the PhD of recovery programs. So if you've entered into this territory at all, give yourself a big damn hug. All right. I'm going to waste no more time, friends. This is Kelly McDaniel. Let's just start at the beginning. That's always a good place to start. (laughs) Many people have probably never heard the phrase mother hunger. So what is it and why did you call it that versus, say, insecure attachment or something? Mm. Well, insecure attachment is somewhat of a clinical term, don't you think? I mean, the good news is attachment theory is becoming somewhat mainstream dialogue um, due to books like attached or the attachment effect, translating attachment theory into what most of us can start to access and enjoy. And yet attachment theory was really part of a way to do research. So we came up with categories such as insecurely attached or securely attached, and then subcategories, avoidantly attached or anxiously attached are part of insecure attachment, right? So there's great information in there and lots of people talking about it, which is wonderful. But I came up with the term mother hunger before we were really talking about attachment in the mainstream. And I was talking about it clinically, but I really wanted a word that would explain what it feels like to be insecurely attached without saying I'm insecurely attached. Because the word insecure connotes some shame as if there's something, nobody wants to be called insecure, right? No. Mother hunger is a word that found me the more clinical work I was doing. I would be working with women who recovering from patterns of love addiction, relationship addiction, and we would get into some depth of recovery and healing. And in those tender moments where we can access our most vulnerable selves, I would hear over and over again, I want my mom. And that desire for her wasn't light. It was deep. It was urgent. It was a craving. I want her. And there were tears with that. And that hunger for her, hunger is insatiable, right? When we're hungry, we need to eat. It's really difficult to avoid hunger pains. It's really difficult to avoid the urgency that our body's designed to go feed ourselves. Um, that's about survival. So I liked the word hunger because it encapsulated the urgency of what it's like to crave a particular kind of love that we associate with mothers, a nurturing, safe love, a love that's inspiring, a love that we are so enraptured with that we want to be around it a lot. Yeah. It works. It works. Mm. I, I 
I appreciate it. It's it's almost hard. The first time I heard it, I kind of did a, mm-hmm. like a you know, mm-hmm. like you, your body recognized. Mm-hmm. There's a truth in that term. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How does yeah. mother hunger show up in someone's life? How does it present itself? Mm-hmm. Well, I write and treat adult women. So I'm going to speak primarily about how it shows up for women, but I will say a word too for men. But <clears throat> when I'm talking about women, I'm talking about traditional women, female bodies that are raised in patriarchal culture to, we're raised in the girl code. We're raised in a femininity code, that there are certain ways to behave that will um, teach you to submit, serve, and seduce a partner. So there's Mm -hmm. this cultural programming that women experience that plays into how our mothers learn to be women, how our grandmothers learn to be women, how we learn to be women growing up with our maternal ancestors. So when we become adults, mother hunger may look like manifestations in the extreme of some of that cultural programming. For example, we can be very good at manipulating our bodies, our personality to attract attention because what we're really trying to attract is the primal need for nurturing, and that's touch, that's love. And we don't know that's what we're doing, but our Mm -hmm. body has figured out a way to get touched, to get Mm -hmm. attention that maybe we were missing. And so if we missed out on adequate maternal nurturing, we may find ourselves starved for affection and touch, and we may find ourselves getting it in ways that that are harmful. So that's love addiction. That can be compulsive sexual behavior that doesn't really reflect a healthy sense of who we are. We may appear to be somewhat needy and insatiable because the need is actually very young and very developmental. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, the other way we're nurtured as little ones is with how we're fed. Our first experience of being fed as little ones um, comes with feelings of pleasure with a full belly but might not have come with feelings of pleasure about being held. Maybe we weren't held when we were fed. We were fed in a carrier. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe the person feeding us was irritated or bothered or distracted, and there wasn't eye gazing and cooing. And so feeding may or may not have been a good experience if it was a yummy experience, but there were other things missing in our life. We may look to food to fill that sense of, oh, I'm okay and I'm loved. If it was not a yummy experience, we may go the other direction and deprive ourselves as food. So as adults, mother hunger can show up as disordered eating patterns that are on all kinds of spectrum. Like there's not one way, just like we have different romantic patterns. But what I do is when a woman starts to talk to me about food, I know that she's talking to me about her best friend. I know to go very slowly, listen to the nuances of the story she has with food, because there's so much information in that story. It's usually one of the last stories a woman will tell. Wow. That's a shame. I, I, I have a whole series of questions about the food connection, because that to me is so massive in your work. Yeah. And f- revealing that was like a, this entirely new aspect of a connection of, from my past mm. and my behaviors because the food stuff presented itself first before any alcohol addiction, drugs, men, anything. So I so I want to put a pin in that and, and go back to it. Let's do. It's a really, really hard topic to think about and talk about and work with. So can you just speak to that, how difficult it is and, and why it's difficult, why this topic is so hard to broach, Mm. the topic of our mothers. The topic of our mothers is difficult to broach for multiple reasons. Um, As daughters, we're raised to be good daughters. And talking about anything less than pleasant about our relationship with our mother can bring up a deep sense of guilt and uh, uh, we're betraying her. There's also not a safe place to go talk about this because lots of clinicians in graduate school are not given any training on how to talk about 
harmful mothers or what mothering is or what happens when attachment doesn't go well. There's just no discussion about it. There's not a good training for it. And so a lot of clinicians who've been trained in family systems, let's say, are going to work to mm-hmm. really push an adult daughter to to make amends with a mother. And in, in some situations, that's not in a daughter's best interest. And they don't know that. So there's not been a safe place to have a conversation on this level. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are some of the reasons it's difficult. I think in our culture, too, we're so hard on mothers that to, to, to decide to look at what you might have missed in childhood, whether I missed nurturing or some protection or some guidance, feels like another way that I'm, I'm partaking and beating up on mothers, which is already a cultural, pervasive horrifying things. So it, it's, it's, it's a very tricky, tricky road to go down. And that's why um, I almost didn't write this book. I was concerned that by putting this literature out there, I would be contributing somehow to the culture of misogyny that already doesn't support or love women and mothers mm-hmm. and therefore children. But the women I've been working with really wanted me to write this book. They especially wanted me to talk about food mm-hmm. Um because there's just not a piece of material out there that explains why so many of us struggle with food and explains it in a way that we feel the shame goes away because now we have a story. Now we know why. But ready to heal is really difficult for other reasons. I think facing an addiction, whether it's alcohol, food, sex and love, work, shopping, facing any addiction is really, really difficult. But food addiction and love addiction are the two most primary addictions, and they're usually beneath some of the other process addictions, um, such as shopping and gambling, but then even alcohol and drugs. Those are usually masking the true tender, primitive heartbreak. The first heartbreak comes with how and when we're held and fed as babies. How we're touched is what we learn what love is. How we're fed, how we're held is how we learn what love is. So unfortunately, lots of parents follow the misguidance that don't touch that baby too much. You'll spoil her. Don't feed that baby when she cries. Put her on a schedule. You'll spoil her. The opposite is what's happening. Spoiling means leaving something on a shelf to rot. Mm. You can't hold a baby too much. You can't overfeed a baby. A baby knows when she's hungry and when she's full, she'll stop. And when she cries, give it a try. But to train her, her biological instinct for sleep, for needing to be close, and for needing to eat is creating a broken heart. The feelings that even still come up in me, even when I was preparing for this, is Mm -hmm. guilt. Even though I've done a good amount of this work, I still feel guilty. Yeah. Because yeah. my mom I know my mom did the best she could. Exactly. And um and I still have the sense that I'm kind of being dramatic mm-hmm. and making things up. Okay. okay. So I have okay. a feeling that's probably pretty common. Yes. Can you speak to that a little bit? It doesn't even mean they didn't love you. It doesn't I'll use you in specific. It doesn't mean your mother didn't love you, even if she couldn't meet your attachment needs. So attachment needs and love don't always translate. So I'll say more about what mother Mm. hunger, how it forms. So as little animals, little mammals, we're born with basic needs for nurturing, which includes touch, feeding, eye contact, holding, constant proximity. We're born also needing protection. Obviously, if we're not safe, we don't survive. But all these studies have been done to show that a baby may be safe. She has a roof over her head. She's got um, a place to sleep. But she won't know she's safe unless she's also held very Mm. close to uh, her primary caregiver. So too much separation for an infant at the wrong times developmentally can register as lack of protection as well as lack of nurturing. But lack of protection can happen at any time because let's face it, as women in this culture, we are wired to kind of be on guard. We know at any given time, any one of us is not safe. We don't always Mm -hmm. feel safe in our home alone. We don't feel safe walking down a street. We've got our car keys ready going to the car. Some of us carry something in our bag that will threaten somebody who tries to hurt us. So Mm -hmm. 
our bodies are wired to be on alert because in this culture, we're sexual prey. So yeah. even a well-meaning mother who loves her daughter may not know how to protect her because she's still trying to figure out how to protect herself. And I just want to say this has nothing to do with love, but everything to do with what it's like to try to be a mother in a culture that does not support and like women. Hmm. So those are the two fundamental elements that little ones need, uh, nurturing and protection. But the third one is guidance. And we need guidance as we get older. We want to look to our mother. We would love to learn how to be a woman by modeling her. We want to admire her. We want her to inspire us. And I think yeah. some of the saddest forms of mother hunger I hear in my office, they may be mild in so far as a, a woman had a playful mother and she had a mother that kept her safe. But as she got older, she realized her mother had not been able to fulfill her own dreams in life. Mm -hmm. Her emotional development had arrested at a young age. And so women realized in about middle school or high school, they were actually outgrowing their mother. They were mm -hmm. older. They felt like they had to mother their mother in ways, or they were embarrassed by her. Yeah. That's a lack of guidance. It, it doesn't necessarily form a profound wound like the other two do, but it it's a source of shame and embarrassment. And talk about guilt. For a daughter to say, my mother embarrassed me, is almost sacrilegious. Mother hunger is our first heartbreak. Yes. When she's doing the best she can, or let's just say there's so many reasons a mom might not be able to nurture and protect us, right? She may be struggling with her own addiction. She may be not unsafe with her partner. She may have an insane work schedule that doesn't value how much time and effort it's going to take to become a mother. She may not have been aware that she was going to need to nurture and protect an infant in order to right. protect that baby from insecure attachment. And then there are things that happen where she may die prematurely. She could die in childbirth, and then we're given away. She could um, die when we're I, – I think any time a mom dies before we ourselves become a mother, it's devastating Yeah, to become a mother without a mom. Yeah. Anyway, there are so many reasons mother hunger could happen that have nothing to do with our mother loving us or wanting us. I'm so glad you said it like that. Yes, it takes them off the hook. And mm -hmm. it, speaking as a mother, I want to get another thing sort of out in the open that might be on people's minds as they're starting to listen. It's almost impossible to receive this work if you are a mother or a parent even without yes. without switching the roles and thinking, mm -hmm. oh my God, what what did I do? What am I doing wrong? You talk about the importance of the first thousand days. Yes. And I was in active addiction during that time with my daughter. We got separated. My her and her, me and her dad got separated when she was three years old, mm -hmm. and we were under extreme financial duress and also mm -hmm. just relational stress. I know you wrote this specifically for the daughters, not as mm -hmm. parenting advice. So, what can you say to maybe help people take a deep breath and relax <laughs> as they're continuing to listen? Mm, definitely. I'm so glad you brought this up. And thank you for sharing a bit about your story as a mother of a daughter and what was going on. Mm -hmm. I can't say this enough, but just as our epigenetic wounding will pass to our children, so will our healing. Mm -hmm. So the more you heal this tender heartbreak without words, your healing translates to your daughter mm. across the lifespan. And then the beautiful thing is when you're raising a daughter, daughters never outgrow their need or desire for their mother, ever. And so even if the first formative years didn't go so well, you're going to have so many other opportunities to show up with more emotional presence, more physical presence when she's still going to need you, when she gets her period the first time. Mm -hmm. When she's struggling with her girlfriends in school, when she has an extended separation for whatever reason and comes back, um, when she starts dating, when she gets married, if she does, mm -hmm. and, and then definitely when she has a baby. These are life 
rites of passage that open the portal again, and it's like you have a newborn opportunity. Yeah, that's... I think what's really hard for moms, though, is waiting for those portals. I think what what struggle, what struggle mothers struggle with is they read this, they start feeling a sense of urgency of, I've got to fix this right now. But mm-hmm. keep in mind, your daughter may not need you to fix this right now. You're there. You're there and you're becoming a different mother even as you read it. Mm. And that's fixing it. She doesn't need you to go to her and say, here's what I did wrong. Can you can you forgive me? Sometimes oh, that's more for the mom. No, no, right? no, no. Yes. <laughs> that's just to make us feel better. We can't do that. We mm-hmm. wait and we be our best selves each day. And we grieve. We grieve with the awareness of, oh, I wish I could have a do-over for that particular time. And that's where our grief as mothers lives very close to us side by side. You did a lot of <laughs> a lot of helping and healing just in those few sentences because I work with and I'm uh, surrounded by so many women in recovery. And this is the the heart, the biggest heartbreak of their heartbreaking story is yeah. being a mother who drank, right? And yes. um and sometimes through an, you know, they have adult children and they're just now coming out of it. And so right. that's very heartening to hear. Very, very heartening. To kind of go with what you're saying, when a mother gets older and enters recovery, and so her children are grown and only knew her as totally unavailable, while they may still want her, sometimes that road back together is really, really challenging. And I've not seen a grief quite that difficult as mothers in their 60s and 70s, newly sober, learning about their own mother hunger, going to heal it, and realizing, I really don't know how to reach my children. Mm -hmm. There is no relationship. The children have had to, for whatever reason, perhaps put up walls and boundaries to stay safe. And that is a a really difficult grief. And I think it'll be such a great thing when we can have support groups for mothers that are in that time frame to support one another with that grief. So women aren't carrying it alone when they can't find the bridge back to their adult children. I have noticed a lot. I would say the majority of women that cross my path are not in their, certainly not in their 20s or even 30s, not even in their 40s. It's 50s and 60s. Do you have a hunch hunch about that or maybe even mm-hmm. findings? Like I know for you, you talk about how women come to your work or to address love addiction or mother hunger in that, like much later in life, and often sometimes only when a mother has passed away. Right. I have to imagine that these things are related because as you've yes. talked about, it's the addiction underneath mm-hmm. the addiction. So mm-hmm. the later it, but there's gotta be generational components to that. I think there are biological components to this. And I'll explain. Aha, yes, of course, of course. Our body, Mother Nature, has designed us so beautifully to be protected from pain for as long as possible. Mm. And the pain of awareness that your mom may not have been either the mother you thought she was or able to love you is such a devastating thing to know. We can't know it as children. And yeah. Mother Nature gives us this beautiful thing called denial I and a certain blindness that we literally can't know it, can't see it, because if we did, it would be too terrifying. So we have to wait until there's enough support around us, whether that's a 12-step community, a good therapist, lots of good friends, before our body will even take the blinders off and let us start to see. Mm-hmm. And Given that love addiction is what I call it the PhD of recovery programs, because thank you, um, it so it, yeah. is. My it God, is. <laughs> yeah, it's the final frontier, and it's the hardest recovery of all. Because as women, we are designed to be in a relationship to formulate a self. So what we yes. have to go into withdrawal from the very thing we most need to form who we are. It, it's just not what we're wired to do. So it is. It's just the most difficult, but also. 
I'll call it the PhD program, because when you've faced and working on a love addiction, you are in a PhD program. Then you go to mother hunger and you're getting another PhD. So <laughs> yeah. uh, these things don't generally happen in one's 20s and 30s. And the only time I see people reach this awareness that young, they literally did lose their mother when they were little. Yeah. And so it's been in their face. Whereas the rest of us, if we have a mother and she's physically present, we have this thing called pathological hope that I talk about, oh, which yes. is which is a form of fantasy, right? Mm-hmm. So breeds us and gets us ready for love addiction. But we have this pathological hope that if we pick up the phone this time and call her, or we go home this time for a holiday, or she comes to visit, this time it'll be different. This time she's going to be the mom I want. And then when it doesn't happen and we're disappointed again, we grieve for a few days, we may act out for a few days, and then some time goes by and we do it again. And we do it again. As long as she's on the planet, we can get caught in this I call it pathological hope because we can't see who she is really. We're being protected literally with can't. us. Yes. Literally can't. Yeah. And I think the most painful withdrawal we go through is taking a break sometimes from a mother who causes us so much pain that we have to we have to take a 30, 60, 90 day break, just like in love addiction recovery, mm-hmm. and try to come to terms with I can't pick up the phone and text her right now and sit with what that feels like. Mm. And start to come out of the fantasy mother, come out of the trance that I'm that I have a mother. Because we may have a physical mother, but if she doesn't know how to mother us, we will show symptoms of being motherless. Oh, we show symptoms of being undermothered and orphaned. And so we have to almost let that be true so that we can come back to her and not expect her to mother us. We have to find other mothers by facing the fact that she can't and won't and isn't. So we still want a mom. We just don't necessarily want the one we have. But we have to go into some withdrawal before we can really know that. Yeah. That's late in life stuff unless it gets forced on us because she dies. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the executive producer of Tell Me Something True and co-created the show with Laura. You know, we have one goal here. Put something into the world that helps all of us figure out how we can have a better week. We think the best way to do that is to keep the pod ad-free so all of the work goes toward making something that's useful for you instead of hustling to keep advertisers happy. And this is where you come in. TMSD Plus is the membership program that helps to keep this show going. And whether it's through a monthly membership or a one-time contribution, TMST Plus members are super important because they help to pay for the pod's production and distribution costs. When you're a member, you get to join Laura for member-only events, send in questions for the AMAs, and you get access to the complete unedited interviews. It's pretty sweet, makes a difference, and you can make it happen with a one-time gift or for as little as five or 10 bucks a month. If your situation is such that becoming a member doesn't work, it's all good. We hope you enjoy the show, maybe share it with a friend or two, and we hope you check out the playlist we put together every week on Spotify. Just search the playlists for Tell Me Something True. It's free, and look, we're just thrilled that you're here. If you can become a member, you can find the link in the show description. Head over to tmstpod.com. It takes less than two minutes. Thanks a lot. What is typically the inciting incident? And I know there's never one, but what is the thing that finally brings people to your, you know, your door, so to speak? What makes them ready? It's different for everyone. And it became different as I became more known as an author. Before I was known as an author, women would come to see me because they thought they wanted to uh, navigate their depression or their anxiety. They had no idea they were navigating a love addiction. They certainly had no idea they had some mother hunger. Now that these books are out in the world and circulating, women find them 
And I am lucky to get to work with women who have already identified, here's what I'm doing. And generally, they've already done some good work on their love addiction, not necessarily their mother hunger. This is too new, still very fresh and in its infancy. Um, So no woman comes to me really last year that said, help me with mother hunger. Um, But they now are, although right now what I'm doing I think I've told you is really training clinicians so that more clinicians can help because it's just me. That's not going to be real helpful (laughs) for the (laughs) magnitude of women that have this issue. And just incidentally, the science tells us that 50% of us are insecurely attached and that's conservative, I think, but that's what the science says. So if that's true, 50% of us out there have mother hunger. And so I need to train therapists to be better able to work with this without further shaming or giving the wrong kind of guidance. We need good guidance. Yeah. And I'm guessing the sort of inciting, like the reason people show up is is almost always the same. They're just in so much pain, you know. To, so much pain. At just the door the of love stop. addiction. It mm-hmm. just make the pain stop. And they've mm-hmm. probably, like I had, tried everything else. Everything. Everything. Yeah. You finally realize, if I could fix this, I would have. Yeah. And you finally kind of have to surrender. It's a total surrender. It is a complete yeah. loss of faith in oneself to fix this problem. And that's a that's a crisis in and of its own because I think when we have to face that we can't fix this alone, we lose so much trust in our own capabilities. And that's that's its own crisis, don't you think? Oh, for sure. And often, at least with me, I had already gotten sober for from alcohol and I thought that was the hardest thing. It was the hardest thing I'd ever gone through. And then it was like, really? Something else? <laughs> this and I have all these tools and I know all the, you know, I have all the, and, and how can something as innate as wanting to be loved be a problem? Like that was the the thought process. Like this can't, you know, I just have to learn better boundaries and I have to, uh, but I had thrown the book at it for years and it was just getting worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's also progressive. It's progressive like every other addiction. And I, I'm glad you brought that up, Laura, because I think love addiction doesn't get enough discussion because it is so problematic. Love shouldn't theoretically be able to become an addiction, but we don't have another name for it really that that works. So we work with this name um, because it does describe the cyclical nature of going back in, expecting a different result and not getting a different result. So there's the insanity, right? Yeah. The, The effects get worse just like with any other addiction. We keep doing it even though we have terrible consequences, just like with every other addiction. So it fits the criteria. So it that's does. why we use it. And and truly, without intervention, it can it can kill us. That can come in a form of it's it's uh, we starve ourselves because we're so in-depth with this addiction that we die from a weakened heart muscle, which literally heartbreak. And <laughs> heart disease is the leading killer of women. And I have to believe that has a lot to do with love addiction, eating disorders, and mother hunger. Oh, my God. That is what weakens our heart, just as much as poor nutrition, if not more. Wow. So this, we do need to be talking about this. It is a killer. And The other way love addiction is a killer is many women who ended up in these addictive relationships, they become violent. There are extremes of um, jealousy and highs and lows. And in a fit of anger and rage, um, partners kill each other. When there's a betrayal that gets thrown into an addictive relationship, the rage that can come out, we literally, we do black out. We don't have control over our cognition right then, our frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. We become purely... Um, in our animal brain, which is all about survival. And this threat, this person who I thought had my back is now the enemy. Terrible things happen. Yeah. And and even to the point of, you know, prioritizing, just like with drinking, prioritizing that over my daughter and being yeah. shocked by that. I think so many mothers struggle when love addiction is in your life and so are children. Yes. I think that's just such a um, compelling biological double bind. You want to mother, and yet you need your own mothering, and it looks like this relationship's going to give it to you because you don't even know that's what you're craving. You don't even know it's mother hunger that keeps pushing you toward this romantic connection, which is what we think we need. 
Yeah. We don't know that we're really trying to meet primitive needs that are probably about the same age as our own child. So a lot of us, let's say we're mothering a three-year-old, we're still three. We're still a three-year-old waiting for mama to nurture us and protect us. And here our own daughter needs it, and yet we don't really have it. And that's terrifying. And very subconscious, too. We don't know. We're just afraid. We're just just afraid. afraid. Mm -hmm. And we may dissociate a lot because we're afraid, Mm -hmm. which adds to the kind of complicated nature of we're there physically with our child, but because we're dissociating because we're afraid, we're not there emotionally. And this was my experience, too, as a young mother. I was there physically. I was doing what the attachment literature told me to do, nursing on demand, never let him cry it out in the crib. That was all great. But I was so overwhelmed with some of my own undealt with stuff and just the sheer magnitude of love, loving this baby. Yes. That's also can cause us to dissociate. We've never felt it. We've never felt that kind of love. So our body goes into overwhelm and doesn't differentiate between that's a threat or that's a good thing. And I disassociated. So even though I'd be holding him emotionally, I was floating around somewhere. How do we survive this? It's a miracle, I think. It is a miracle. And I think it speaks to our innate resilience. I I, I want to just kind of, this might be a good time to remind anyone listening that we are designed to heal. Our whole body mm-hmm. is designed for wellness. We're designed to be physically healthy. We're designed to be emotionally healthy, spiritually healthy, psychologically healthy. Our culture is not helping us with this. Mm-hmm. But our biology is very resilient. And that's why... The first step in healing mother hunger is actually hearing the term. So you explained what it was like when you heard it. You kind of had a deep belly (gasps) breath, a knowing. And that's because when the body hears, when the brain hears a term that gives a name to what the body's trying to heal, the body's like, okay, we got it now. And cells start falling into place. Yeah, The body starts lining up for what we need to do next. So that works too when we name an addiction. That works when you go to the doctor Mm -hmm. and the doctor says, oh, it looks like um, you have the flu. So then the doctor knows what to give you for the flu. Before that, you might be trying things, nothing's working. The right name really helps. It helps so much. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, depression, anxiety, Mm -hmm. ADHD, having that, those, those labels can, I don't want to call them labels in that case. It's like a, there's a reason. (laughs) I'm not just crazy and floating around and broken. and That's where a name is really helpful so we don't feel crazy. So we usually think of romantic relationships as the place where this all shows up, but you talk about how it can show up uh, in any type of relationship, including work settings and friendships. Can you talk about what that might look like? Well, it can look very diverse because every relationship every daughter has with a mother is unique. So the way mother hunger is going to show up is unique to each daughter. So it can show up at work because in a workplace, we're surrounded by, if we're young, authority figures. And our first Mm -hmm. authority figure was our mother. So whatever we might have needed from her that we're not in touch with, we can unconsciously hope, expect that a supervisor, a boss, a mentor will provide us with those needs. And when they don't, we get kind of, and so we can start to have some conflicts with authority figures that make no sense to us, or we just out and out don't trust them in the first place. We already know they're going to let us down. So we kind of already have an armor on, like, uh, you're not going to tell me what to do, right? So we can either be kind of brittle or kind of hopeful is what I've seen in the workplace. With our friends, I've seen this, again, It's unconscious. We don't know that we are starving. We are hungry for nurturing or protection or guidance. So with our friends, we may expect them to do this for us. We may get really disappointed if they don't seem to understand we need a certain kind of um, phone call when we're down, or they don't understand our love language. They don't Mm -hmm. know that we want quality time. They don't know that we need words of affirmation or acts of service. Or we may look to our friends as a mother like inspire me, yeah. guide me. And yeah. we go one down. We we look to I've her done to that. kind of, sure. So we either put her on a pedestal or we only have friends that put us on a pedestal because we yep. need to feel 
we need to feel a boost to our self-esteem because really deep down we feel pretty unlovable. So I find it's really hard to find mutuality with our friends. Yes. We're either one up, we're either one down, we're always chasing something and getting disappointed. Wow, that hits home. Yeah. I've I've had relationships like on, on both sides. On both and, sides. And uh, those don't go very well. Yeah. They, no, they, they don't. I talk about this a lot in Ready to Heal. I talk about female friendships, how for someone who's struggling with love addiction, women are just really not that interesting. So they come in, I put them in three categories in Ready to Heal. You've got the friend who you've got a crush on, or you've got the friend who's your acting out girlfriend, or you've got the friend that just fills in the, the dead space because you can't be alone. Yeah. What do you mean women aren't that interesting? What did you mean by that? That didn't sound like a statement you would make. And what I mean by that is that when we are in love addiction, what I've seen women do, unless they are a love addicted to, unless they're in a lesbian relationship, then it's mm-hmm. the same. Mm-hmm. Women are not interested in heterosexual women. They're interested in men. And so a woman is either something that gets in the way of getting uh. to that man or something that she needs somebody to go with her to the bar to pick somebody up. Oh, God, I see. Okay, yes. And what they're not dealing with is a basic inherent mistrust of women because they don't trust themselves. Yeah. Generally, women who are in love addiction have so much self-hate that they just don't trust other women either. We don't trust Mm -hmm. ourselves, so we don't trust anyone else. So that's what I mean. Like women are seen as competitors, not as allies. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm talking in a heterosexual sense. You talk about frozen grief Mm -hmm. and mother hunger. And that just, that was another phrase where I had the, the gasp feeling reading it, frozen grief. Talk about that. I will. Yeah. We can't grieve what we don't know we have. And you and I have been talking about how difficult it is, even if we've heard the term mother hunger, well, then what do we do? Where do we talk about this? Where we won't be shamed or silenced. Right. So Mm -hmm. this is disenfranchised grief. Like when we figure out we've got pain, but there's no cultural recognition for that pain, it's disenfranchised. So many of us have had an experience where we've had some form of a cancer diagnosis. Terrifying, right? Mm -hmm. But we hear that and we know other people go through that. We know there are support groups. There are people we can call. We'll instantly get some sympathy. We'll instantly get some guidance. We'll instantly have some ally, right? That yeah. helps grief flow. That helps the grief process begin. And with mother hunger, we don't have that. There's right. no place we can instantly pick up the phone and say, I just figured out what it is. And then all of a sudden the troops surround us with love and food and support to take care of our children and money for therapy and <laughs> a support group. If we had all that, the grief could flow and the grief has to flow, but mm-hmm. it gets frozen in our body because either we don't even know what we have, or once we do know, there's no place to talk about it. It's mm-hmm. disenfranchised. There's not cultural mm-hmm. recognition. So it gets frozen in our bodies. And it just and waits. It just waits. It, and it causes a lot of havoc. I mean, this is why I think a lot of us have chronic trouble with sleep. We have trouble with pain around our neck and head, um, mm-hmm. lower back, and in our pelvic region. Lots of stress <laughs> on the body to carry pain for that long. And to carry grief can also cause so much stress on the body that our immune system is compromised. And that's why we have lots of chronic fatigue and an autoimmune trouble as well. Yeah. Wow. It's a stress response. I thought the part of your book where you talk in Mother Hunger, uh, where you talk about the double bind that women are in around their sexuality, just hit me right in the face because I have a 13 year old daughter realizing she's a sexual being and yeah. internalizing all these messages. And then yeah. what do I, you know, I know for me, I, I, I was caught in this double bind for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, so ex- can you explain what that double bind is around sexuality for women and, and how it impacts them? Mm-hmm. Girls and women, it's really girls. And it does start right when you're speaking. And I, first of all, I just want to say my heart feels so full. You're mothering a 13-year-old daughter. Yes. And I think that's the most terrifying thing to watch the culture take your daughter and turn her into something that might cause her harm. This cultural piece that you talk about, I think, is is the missing puzzle piece for so much of this. It just validates how pervasive this is. 
and it how is. omnipresent it is from day one. It's woven into the air that we breathe. Um, I use the example of the little fish, little fish that are swimming in water, and the big fish is coming the other direction in the water and turns to the little fish and say, how's the water today, boys? And the little fish keeps swimming along and finally one turns to the other and said, what the heck's the water? Yeah. They're in it, so they don't know what the water is. <laughs> yeah. That's what patriarchy is for us. Mm-hmm. We're in it, and we don't know it, but it's in the air we breathe. It's in the fabric of our soul. And what little girls are learning is that we are here to attract a mate, and our bodies are used as sex objects in the media everywhere. It's even in fairy tales, unfortunately. And Mm -hmm. so we grow up somehow with this sense that there's a prize out there to get. And that prize isn't necessarily a a best friend. It's It's a mate who's going to bring us a sense of power and a sense of self worth. And what are we going to have to do to get that mate? Oh, good gosh. I mean, there are cultural ways this is different based on our color, based on our socioeconomic background, and based on what part of the world we're in. But there are ways that we twist ourselves as women into whatever it is we think we need to be to attract this mate. And this is what I was saying earlier, that unfortunately, because we are learning this, we might view our girlfriends as a threat as a as competition because boys are growing up learning that women are trophies and part of the boy culture is they want the trophy to prove they're bigger more alpha than the other boys that may be the mm-hmm. conquest that may be the prettiest that may be the sheer numbers volume i don't know but it's like a sporting event for boys and yeah. girls are the event it's oh. And that's really going on in middle school, where the pack mentality for boys is getting very strong, and they're trying to prove who's the alpha male, and sometimes they're using women to do that. Women. These are girls, right? And so the girls are kind of caught with, I don't want this. I sure don't want this kind of attention, and yet I better be good at it because this is how I'm going to be seen. So it starts young, and it um, keeps going. Yeah, and then the the messages of I want you're supposed to be good, right? And being That's good ready to heal. Yes, means not having sex, not being a sexual being, um, not being a sexual being, mm-hmm. but your body and your sexuality are the thing that you can use to attract. So right. how do you fucking win at that game? You don't. You got it. Those are the four cultural beliefs I identified in Ready to Heal. And you've got to be sexy to be loved. But if you're sexy, then you're bad because you're supposed to be good. And good means you're not sexy. So you can't be both. And women try to be both. Yeah, of course. And no wonder there's a lot of anxiety and depression and cutting and frustration because there's that's a no-win, which you explained it's a beautifully. no-win. Mm-hmm. So I want to spend a little bit of time on the food part, and then we'll go to his, this healing and hope because I do want to leave people with a, a hopeful message. You wrote this this li- two lines in Mother Hunger just blew me away. You say, when maternal nurturance is compromised, food provides the first sense of real comfort. Food rescues a hungry heart. You went on to write, I looked at maladaptive eating habits as wordless despair. Eating patterns tell the story of early attachment, so I pay attention. Why food? Why does it show up as food? Food is life and food is love. And when we're infants, we are totally relying on our caregiver to feed us. And when we're fed, um, it feels good. Because hunger doesn't feel good. And so when we're fed, our little body is like, ah, it feels really good. Mm -hmm. So let's take that example of an infant, a newborn who just got the warm milk from her caregiver, and she feels really good. And that's wonderful. The same caregiver, however, let's say, um, 
put her down right away to cry it out in the crib. Mm. That does not feel good. What happens is, okay, the full belly felt good, but being left alone now does not feel good. So the baby cries, but this poor mother has been told, let your baby cry. So then what's happening is the baby's going into a fear state, terror state, and is being flooded with cortisol and adrenaline to prepare the baby for a threat. Too much of that in the baby system too many times creates a profound dorsal effect. Sure, the baby looks like it's asleep, but what the baby's learned to do is to detach from the world. Mm. In an, uh, this is Mother Nature saying, you're, you're probably going to die, so I'm going to make sure you don't feel it. So this is the first time we dissociate in the crib, right? So if you hear what I'm saying, the food feels good, but the caregiver does not. The food, the full belly feels good, the caregiver does not. So how do you think that's going to go as this child grows up and this is the pattern? It's going to go that as soon as I can crawl or walk, I'm going to go find some food. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to go that when I come from, from a bad day at school, I'm not going toward my caregiver. I already don't trust my caregiver. I already know to auto-regulate myself with food, so I'm going for the ice cream. Yeah. I'm going for the bag of Cheetos. That's where my comfort is. It's in the feeling of being full. It is not in a relational person because I've already learned they're going to let me down. I've already learned it's all up to me to self-soothe. And food's one of the best ways to self-soothe. This feels very groundbreaking to ha to make this connection for women because I don't know one woman who doesn't have food issues, body issues, or hasn't had them and had to work through them. Right. It certainly was is part of my story. And it feels like we've just – and then there's this entire industry complex created to address the symptom or right. just further the problem. Right. Yep. Precisely. So have you seen women's relationship with food and their bodies improve once they address mother hunger? Oh, definitely. Most definitely. And I also just kind of want to say, I gave one example um, that didn't really address what happens in anorexia. Mm -hmm. So I, women who have learned to thoroughly deprive themselves of food have grown more comfort with I want an empty stomach because that means I need no one. That's right. I need nothing, no one. I don't even need to be fed. So the, these are these are both telling the story of the primary attachment injury. Make sense? Okay. Oh yeah, so, that was my story. Okay. With food, and then it swung to the other side, mm -hmm. which is really normal. That it'll kind of start in one place on either end of the spectrum, whether it's the indulgence end or the deprivation end. And then swing back and forth for quite some time before finding balance. I find that um, the balance that we're going for here, which is to eat for strength and fuel and nutrition and well-being, and yes, that's pleasurable, but we're not eating to escape. That that's lifetime work. It but, is. But it it once we understand the root, that really helps the work speed up. Let's talk about healing and hope. Is there hope? And what does the healing journey actually look like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is hope. Um, but I want to put a disclaimer. Um, and we haven't spent time talking about this today, which I'm glad. I don't, I don't love talking about this in public because it's so triggering. But there's mm -hmm. a chapter in the Mother Hunger book called Third Degree Mother Hunger. Third Degree Mother Hunger is when you not only missed out on maternal nurturing, protection, or guidance, you missed all three, and your mother was abusive. She was frightening. When we grow up terrified of the person we need the most, it causes all kinds of um, real brain damage, which, as we grow, begins to look like personality disorders. So when we're healing third-degree mother hunger, that's a much longer journey. Um, it's harder to find a practitioner that can help us because that practitioner needs to understand this personality disorder is a misnomer, that this is third-degree mother hunger, which means this person has never known what it feels like to be safe in her own body or in a relationship ever in her life. 
So you've got to really titrate the therapy. You have to be trained in complex trauma. You need to be trained in attachment. You need to be trained in sensor, sensory motor skills and EMDR. That's a lot of training. But if you have third degree mother hunger, you deserve someone who understands the complexity of this trauma and would understand why your personality at times might look borderline yeah. or it might look bipolar because yeah. of course it does. That's what happens. Yeah. So right. I'm very glad you said that. So healing mother hunger um, starts with first the name, the body then starts to heal it. And then it starts with, okay, understanding mothering. Mothering requires nurturing. And so you read, you learn, and then you start to think, oh, I think I missed out on some nurturing. So then I have all these suggested strategies to replace nurturing yourself now. But let's say you had plenty of nurturing. Your mom was affectionate, playful, but you didn't have much protection. You kind of felt like you were out there flapping in the wind a lot as you were growing up. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of anxiety as, as an adult. I have strategies for how now to minimize feelings of anxiety and what to do to give yourself protection. Like don't turn on the news. Don't start the day with your with the news feed. Um, start the day quiet with some quiet music and um, meditation time. Maybe you had plenty of nurturing, plenty of protection, but you didn't have any maternal guidance. Finding guidance now is sometimes as simple as finding a woman you admire, whether that's a sponsor, a coach, a therapist, mm -hmm. an older woman who might live next door, who there's something about her you're attracted to, you would really like, and spend time with her. Um, yeah. This is one of the greatest things about 12-step programs is that whole thing of find a sponsor. I've worked with so many women who get nurturing protection and guidance from a sponsor. Yeah. There's a sense of safety in their 12-step meeting that they've never felt below, before in their lives. So that starts healing protection. Nobody's going to touch you inappropriately. So women can start to maybe start to feel some nurturing because they can sit and feel safe, hear kind words, but not feel like they're sexually in danger. Yep. So I find that the women who work with me who really want to heal this, if they've already found that they have an addiction and they're doing 12-step program, they heal much faster than the women who either don't know they have an addiction, so they've not been to one, or they're like, oh, that's not for me. I can't do that. Right. right. I hear that a lot. I'm just thinking, where's the entry point for someone who isn't exposed to a recovery mm -hmm. group of some kind? Yeah. Where's yeah. the entry point? A lot of times that entry point comes when they're much older and they can't connect with their adult daughter and they're in so much pain. Mm. They're like, what did I do? And they come into therapy because their adult children are rejecting them. Oh my God. It, and it's so painful that that is the portal. The other portal is mom dies and the siblings can't connect. So for the first time, the isolation is so much and somebody says, usually a doctor, why don't you go see a counselor and do some grief work? That is what healing mother hunger really looks like. It looks like learning to, because the grief has been frozen. So first there's awareness and then there's some things we can do. This is ongoing grief work because we have to let it thaw and naming mm -hmm. it and starting to tend to the wounded little girl inside of us who needs a mom. And we start to mother her now. The grief starts to thaw, but then there it is. There's the grief. Every time and I there it is. give myself something I wish I'd had as a little girl, it feels better, but then I'm so sad too. I'm grieving. So there's a lot of grief ongoing. Yeah, it's a process. Very much. Oh, well, thank you. I know this conversation is going to re it just hit people in a place they didn't even know that they needed to be reached. So I mm -hmm. thank you so much for your work. Truly, truly, I think you are doing absolutely groundbreaking work that is going to help millions and millions of women. Uh, and I really I'm hope it does. You're so welcome. And I appreciate your support having me here because truly, this is how we get this book into the hands of the woman who needs it. Because yeah. it is something that's not yet part of the larger cultural dialogue. That's yeah. the biggest gift we can give each other as we as sisters try to change this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you want more TMST, head on over to tmstpod.com and become a member. Members get access to the full uncut versions of these conversations, previews of upcoming guests, invites to join me for members-only events, and access to our members-only community where I hang out a lot. We decided from the beginning to make this an independent project. We don't have sponsors and we don't run ads. This means that we can make the show all about you and not what our sponsors or advertisers want. But it also means we're 100% reliant on your support. So my request and my invitation is simple. Support the show by becoming a member, or you can simply make a one-time donation of as little as $5. I cannot stress this enough. You can make a huge difference for as little as $5. Please head over to tmstpod.com right now. Tell Me Something True is engineered and mixed by Paul Chufo. Michael Elsesser and I dreamed up this show, and we're looking forward to joining you online and next time on Tell Me Something True.